There has been a disconnect that has been very long. We have to give that room, that space, that time, that opportunity for the children to again find their feet in the school environment. Hello and a very warm welcome to Great Principles. I am Seema Choria. I bring to you another iconic figure from the world of Indian Academia. Leadership is about ownership, about teamwork, about being approachable and accessible. It is the art of decision-making and setting direction. Valuable leadership skills includes the ability to delegate, inspire, and communicate effectively. My guest today evokes many thoughts and feelings about leadership in the context of education. I'm sure we shall address a few questions that may raise many brows and some may even ignite a fiery debate later. Well, isn't that what we at Great Principles intend to do? Ask, inquire, find answers to issues that are currently swept under the carpet. Understand ideologies and philosophies of school leaders who took to reform learning by doing what was redundant and bringing a new value adding schooling. We will let's brace ourselves as we break a few myths and find remedies to cure our ailing education system. I'm very happy to welcome our accomplished guest of the day, Mr. Payam Shogi, founder principal, Venkateshwar Signature School, Raipur. Welcome to Great Principles, sir. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you so much. In fact, the honor is all mine. The Great Principles program and I've been, uh, since, uh, I'm very privileged and very honored. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. So, sir, beginning with, we would like to know from you, you have, you, yours is an inspi inspiring once upon a time story, you know, from applying physics and mathematical principles to design and manufacture mechanical goods, to establishing schools and designing curriculums, you have carved a niche for yourself as an educator. So tell us about the reasons that made you shift to education sector. Let me clarify, I graduated to become a mechanical engineer and I was trying to make a career for myself and it took me towards the corporate world and I went to Jamshedpur and all of that. Um, as I was doing that, and I was in Bihar at that time, this is early 90s, early to mid 90s, um, I started seeing around me a lot of things that caused me a lot of trouble and also raised a lot of questions. For example, a lot of conflicts happening, people by nature appear to be very aggressive and they did, I wondered why and how do mature individuals are not able to resolve their differences in a more peaceful manner? Why is it, and, you know, I'm talking about the 90s, uh, Bihar and Patna and those areas where you had a lot of that kind of stuff going on and it really bothered and it really troubled me. And I had a lot of questions. Now, that was a time when there was no Google auntie or mother Google and you could Google in a whole lot of and get some leads and some answers. They weren't there. So I had to seek those answers. I, uh, long story short, I quit my budding um, career in corporate world. I made a lot of criticism though. And I started meeting people, traveling, reading books. And again, long story short, I realized that the answers are in the field of education. If you really want to change mindsets, if you want to calm down an aggressive person, if you want to change attitudes, if you want to bring in a new vision, a sense of purpose in life, the answers are in the field of education. And that was the turning point for me. I had to do something about that. And I entered the field of education, no regrets ever. I have never looked back after that. Absolutely wonderful journey. So, you know, it's not easy to leave your skyscrapers buildings and the AC cabins and reach out to the education sector. And yes, I totally agree with you. This is the only place where you can inspire people to change, to change their personality, to change their thought process. The only profession which can do so is education. Going further, sir, you have certainly come a long way as a school leader. You launched a school as an experiment, learned, unlearned a lot in the process of becoming a learning expert. So I would like to know from you, what was the hardest thing you had to do to be as successful as a novice school head? 
Well, initially, I was a principal of my own school because once I made the transition from the corporate um, industry, a budding one, and to the field of education, I had to learn about education. What did I know about education at that time? Nothing. I had to learn. So I came down to Patna and we set up a school, a small school, which for me was an experimental school. And of course, I became the principal of it. We got together a young team of people who were enthusiastic, but we all were united in our will and desire to learn. So we started questioning some of the conventions, some of the conventional practices that were there. Some of them are still there today. For example, we wondered why is it that teachers use a red pen to mark the work of children? Nobody ever said that you should use a red pen, no manual, no training, no orientation ever says that, but it happened, so happened that teachers use a red pen. Now, Maybe it's because their own teachers use the red pen. And so therefore, when they became teachers, they started doing that. And there were a whole lot of such questions about assignments, about assessments, about homework, about you name it. There were so many things. And we started questioning all of that. And our buzzword was, is there a better way of doing this? So every single thing that would happen in school education or in the classroom, in the playground, as long as children are in the school, we used to ask ourselves this question, is there a better way of doing this? And that was my learning um, journey. It started there and we learned a lot of things. And uh, well, I did not have much trouble because I was the principal of my own school. But I can tell you that the hardest thing ever for me as a principal has always been to motivate my staff and to keep them focused about one central question. Who we are, where we are, and why are we there? So we are teachers. And we are in a school. So why is it that we are here? What is expected of us? You know, there are many, there are many uh, distractions. There are administrative responsibilities. Then you have to do a whole lot of corrections. Then you have to give a test. And then you have to do this and that. And then you have to manage the children. And then we forget. We forget who we are. We forget that we are teachers and a lot at stake. So I think as a principal, this has been my greater than to this day. It is one of the most greatest challenges to keep everybody focused. As long as we are in a temple of learning in a school, we have something very great to do. Absolutely, sir. You know, sitting on this chair as a school leader, it is, it is, you know, it is exciting, it is challenging, it is risky also, yet it is very, very rewarding and fulfilling journey when you change so many lives. And as you rightly said, sir, you know. Most important thing is that each and every person of a school or, or, or an organization needs to know that what is the mission and vision they are there for. So, you know, somewhere, somewhere in the routine, we, you know, deviate from our goal. So it is very, very important to buy in time to remind that what you are here for. Yeah. yeah. So going ahead, sir, you are the founder principal of Venkateshwar Signature School, which has been seen a year of delay in opening and face multiple challenges, I think, due to pandemic. So here, I would like to know from you that what would be your strategies to build a gap which has occurred? There has been a substantial learning gap due to pandemic. Many children have fallen behind. So what can be done to bridge this gap? Well, the first thing is that we have to get children back to school. You know, online learning has always been a stopgap arrangement, but it does not compensate in any manner for classrooms, for physical presence of children. You know, there are, there are certain things that can happen only when children are in company of themselves and they're adults and they're learning. For example, socialization happens in such an environment. Then uh, learning pro-social skills is another one. Then, you know, there is a relationship between learning and emotions. Children have to also go through those emotions related to learning and all of that cooperative learning, experiential learning, how do you do that online? So you really have to get everybody back and that's a priority and I hope there, is a, there are glimmerings of hope that things are happening, the uh, uh, whole environment is becoming more conducive. So fingers crossed that it may continue to happen that way and we can get our children back to school and that's the only way we can bridge the gap. Nobody as of now still can measure or can quantify the 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 amount of loss that has set in as a result of children being out of school. Maybe in future there will be research and studies, but we can estimate that a whole lot of opportunities for them, not that they, maybe they were, we can argue and say that 
uh, children should not have been kept out of school or whatever, but the fact is that they were out of school. We have to get them back as soon as possible. However, I want to mention something here. Teachers need to be sensitive. They have to become, they have to be oriented. A new beginning is being made. We cannot go hammer and tong after our children. Yeah, anyway, we should not be doing that. Yeah. More so now, when they come back, there has been a disconnect that has been very long. We have to give that room, that space, that time, that opportunity for the children to again find their feet in the school environment. The government SOPs are very clear on this, on how to create a stress-free environment, and we should be very conscious of that and follow those guidelines. So I think the teachers have a special role here as children begin to find their way to schools. Absolutely, sir. We all are hoping that soon school children will be back. And already, I think from six standard to eight standard, many schools have opened the doors for the children. And yes, you know, schools beyond COVID, there will be a lot of challenges, not only for students, you know, adjusting to the whole after two years coming back to school, even teachers, everyone needs to be more patient, more sensitive to what is being happening. All right. So going ahead now, sir, you know, there has been, you know, a lot of buzz around that uh, schooling has been uh, become a business. So do you think that is schooling being looked at, at, at as a pure business opportunity? It may be so. It doesn't bother me. It really doesn't bother me. If somebody starts a school as a business venture, as long as they are following the government, the, the provisions of the law, and as long as they're giving a certain standard level of education, I have nothing wrong with it. Make your money, reinvest it. The law is very clear that you have you cannot make profit out of schools. You have to have a society or a trust, and so all of that is in place. Um, I think there is one more thing that we forget is that parents have a lot of say and they have a lot of choice. So if you are offering something that parents are okay with and they like that, so so be it. So parents will go for it. They will take a they will take their children to these kind of schools. Here, I think on the same theme, I want to mention how important is the role of the parents in our school education system. I believe that they hold the key to the quality of our school education system. You know, what do parents generally want? Whatever the parents want, schools will give it to them. So parents want big infrastructure, impressive structure, schools will give that to them. They want good results in the board exams. So schools will try harder to do that, to attract more parents. And they want a fleet of buses and physical facilities and maybe air conditioned rooms and all of that. In my 25 years of experience, I have rarely come across a parent who, while seeking admission, asks me, sir, what kind of value education program do you run in your school? Or sir, what kind of skilling do you have for my child? Or that kind of thing. So I believe that if parents will, and these are important, these are higher order thinking. How are you going to help my child to become a higher order thinker? How are you going to do these things for my child? If parents start asking these questions of schools, schools will start giving them too. So I think we should be very clear that if a school is running a business and parents are okay with it and they are happy with whatever is offered, fine. But on a note of advice, parents will need to also seek a lot of other things from schools. Otherwise, chances are they will not be given to them, which are required. Absolutely. I think a very practical answer here today we have got on our platform. You know, what is wrong if it is a school as a business? There is nothing wrong about it. How are we going to attract more youth towards it? How are we going to have more school planners if there have been no opportunities in this sector? How will we make education better? Right, and you, as you rightly said, law is very much in place. So, you know, I think many a times we call business a negative word. You know, we use it in negative sense that it is only for making profit. So that is what has been, uh, you know, being looked upon that you cannot run a school as a business, I think, I suppose this. Yeah, but that's the government provision. You cannot. You actually cannot make profit. Yeah. So um, the regulation, but, but those who want to make money still find their way to make their money. But my issue is that you have to have a certain level of education giving. And so that there are checks and balances for that. And the greatest one is the parents themselves. Absolutely. Right, sir. So, you know, sir, as you said, the parents look up for a lot of infrastructural and a lot of amenities these days in the schools. So what do you think? Are these boots, boutique sort of schools, are they a boon or a bane for our children? 
no school can ever be a bane as long as it opens its portals for children to enter and uh, achieve learning and education it cannot be a bane um, if you ask me a greater bane will be a rundown school with multi grade classrooms with no proper teacher and no proper facilities and children go there and waste their time there and learn nothing and in fact they learn the wrong things over there that's a bane but if there is something that is decent, okay, fine, many branches and they have brands and they do that. But you see, everybody wants to succeed. So you will have promotions, you will have marketing, you'll have advertisements and people will want to attract people and they invest a lot of money in there as well. So what? So I believe that there's no, no, nothing wrong with that. As long as again, they adhere to certain guidelines to what is required and they offer the kind of education that is uh, required. A certain standard, they vary among schools. But if it's acceptable to parents again, why not? Wonderful answer here, you know, that yes, if the school is making what is it, it is bound to, that is, if it is making learning happen, there is nothing wrong with it. Whether it is a five-star hotel or it has uh, all the amenities that we expect as a parent. Right. So I believe ahead. so. I, I, it, it's a little bit uh, revolutionary. Many will um, disagree with that, but you are creating more institutions of learning. The point here is that you have more classrooms. You know, there used to be a time that we don't have enough hotels in India, hospitality industry. It's the same kind of thing. We don't have enough classrooms for children that offer a certain level of, so if these are some of the ones that are doing that, why not? Absolutely, sir. Totally agree with you, sir. So, sir, going ahead, sir. You know, awards are the standardized means to recognize reforms and efforts of excellent workmanship. So do you feel awards make or break school leaders' reputation? Of course, it depends on the school leader. Um, I, I wouldn't know if it would break the reputation. You know, it depends on what kind of reward would break the reputation. But personally, for me, well, it's a momentary satisfaction of uh, your efforts being recognized. But beyond that, it goes and sits on your CV forever and you move on and you, so awards are good. They give you some level of satisfaction. But I think there are two levels of uh, um, award or reward that I personally um, pay greater heed to and greater importance to, I value them a lot. One is my inner voice telling me that I am doing enough or I've done enough or I'm on the right path or I'm learning enough or I'm developing enough all those kind of things and i assure you i do that i introspect and you know there is a saying that you bring yourself into account and you learn and you develop so i do that that's one but if the inner voice tells me that yes you are doing okay be careful that you keep doing that and growing and developing and there is a concept of being and doing you are you become better therefore you do better and as you be, do better you again gain from that and you improve and develop so that's one. The other recognition really is from your own students. You know, the, our industry, our field of education is probably the only one where you can see the results of your efforts almost instantly. You turn around a wayward child and he immediately shows improvement and it can happen and it does happen. So that I think is a recognition. That is your reward. That's your award. And there are many children who come back after many years and say, sir, you are the one who did this for me and today whatever I am is because of you and that kind of thing. I think that's the real reward and that's the satisfaction that you have. And that gives you the motivation to keep going. Absolutely, so very true, you know, when, when you feel that uh, because of me, someone's life has changed and that person has achieved what he would have imagined much more than that, he has achieved what he could have imagined. That is what is actually very satisfactory. So this brings to me to the very interesting segment of the show, which is called rapid fire round. So here you have to answer in one word only, maximum one sentence I'll permit here. Yeah, so here goes the first question for you. What is that one quality a school leader should possess? One quality that a school leader should possess uh, be a learner. Learner, all right. What is your leisure time activity? Reading, reading, learning, which correlates with the first question. <laughs> reading and learning, all right. Read to us a few lines of your favorite book or poem. 
Um, I don't remember anything right now. I was a fan of Enid Blyton when I was small. So whenever I have the time, I go back to those books that I read, but I don't remember anything as of now. No worries, sir. My next question, Litti Choka or Italy Sambo? Pick one. What's that? Litti Choka or Italy Sambo? Pick oh, one. Litti Choka, any day. Any day, all right. Next question is gamification of education. Do you agree to it? That okay. edu game, education can be gamified. Do you agree to this? Education can? I'm not Gamif getting the Gamification of education. Do you agree? Gamification of education, learning through games? Yeah, gamification, you know. That cannot become the ultimate thing. That could be one tool, one channel for learning, but why not? All right. So it was really fun knowing sir here in this section. Now going ahead, sir, you know, we all look up to someone to inspire us, to motivate us. We all have our lows at times. So name one inspiring educator you hold in high esteem. Clearly there's one, Anne Sullivan. Anne Sullivan, her real name was Johanna. She was a teacher of, uh, of uh, Helen Keller. And Helen Keller, we all know, was blind and she was deaf. And uh, Anne Sullivan was her teacher. Now, you see, when a person cannot see and cannot hear, there's no way to make input to the person. And uh, how do you teach such a person? And Anne Sullivan herself, she was uh, visually impaired. And she took up this work. And when uh, Helen Keller was eight years old, she became the teacher and started working with her. Helen Keller went on to graduate the first blind deaf person to graduate from Harvard. She became a multi book author. She became an activist. She became a motivational speaker. And all because of this teacher, Anne Sullivan. She experimented. How do you teach? She experimented so many things. And then finally, she got the breakthrough to get through to her, to teach her words. Her first challenge was to teach her words, 600 words of common things around her and then to teach a language and all of that. And the rest is history. There are so many films and movies and documentaries made on that. It's amazing.